It's interesting in studying the Word of God. You see how that it ties together so many times. And of course, uh, the scripture cannot be broken. So uh, uh, it's, all, it's all the the thoughts and the words of God. And uh, as I look at Paul, as now he is on his farewell tour and he stops off at Ephesus, that's the, was his major work. That's where he spent more time than any other place. That's where he was able to train people more than any other place. He started a little a seminary there. And of course, uh, the seven churches of Revelation probably came from that, that work there in Ephesus and as well as so many others at the uh, uh, other churches in that whole region that are not named. Uh, but we see every place that Paul went in his farewell tour, uh, people wept and they, they were concerned about him. We saw that last week at, uh, when, he was, uh, when he was in Troas. Uh, but uh, there's something about... Uh, about parting uh, with people that have invested their lives in you. And the same way with, with Moses. That's why as you study the book of Deuteronomy, it's only three, uh, it's, it's three basic um, uh, messages that, uh, that Moses gives to the people. And, but you can see time and time again how he talks about how that, you know, choose life. He, t- he talks about how that I loved you and how that the Lord loves you. And I mean, he just really pours out his heart to the people. He says, I can't go with you over into the promised land. God has uh, pre- prevented that. But, oh, this is what you need to go to possess the land. And this is what we'll, we'll God will do if you will just follow him. And what a blessing it is when you start reading a book of, uh, of Deuteronomy where he's talking to people half his age, telling them this is what you can do and what God will, how God will bless you if you'll just follow him. And what a blessing it is to study the book of love. And many people uh, equate, equate to Deuteronomy with uh, the gospel of John, which is, of course, the gospel of love, for God so loved the world. But here we see the great intimate uh, in chapter 20, both at Troas and in Ephesus, we see this great love and dedication that Paul had for the people of God. And notice in verse 17, he says, Now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said, You know from the first day that I came to Asia, and what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, now I go abound to the, in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things which will happen to me there, except the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying, the chains and tribulations await me. (laughs) But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit hath made us overseers to, the, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn you, warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to the Lord 
and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who are with me. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the, the weak and remember the words which our Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most for all of his words which he spake, that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. Now, Father, we pray that you will bless <coughs> the reading and the preaching of your holy word this morning. We thank you for Paul, a man that's probably responsible for us being here today, how that you used him, how that, Lord, uh, he suffered many things and shed many tears for the ministry. May we, Lord, catch a, just a glimpse of this passion. May that be our passion for others. That we would, that the ministry that you have placed within our hearts, where you've saved us, and now you have commissioned us to go into the world. Oh, Father, may we do it with compassion, with care. Yes, we realize the world is sinful, but Lord, may we not get mad at the world, realizing that they're just lost people. But Lord, that we would, with tears, as we would go forth weeping, bearing the precious seed, that you, Lord, that you would allow us to see us bring the sheaves with us, that souls will be saved and lives will be changed as a result of the ministries that you have given us. May we, Lord, realize that there is sacrifice, there are times of, of discouragement. There are times, Lord, of uh, loneliness and peril. And yet you're the God of all. And there's, Lord, we realize that uh, everything works together for good to them that love you, to the called according to your purpose. So, Lord, may we realize that whether this coming week we see blessings or see trials, that we realize that it all works out to your glory. Oh, Father, bless your people now, in Jesus' name, amen. What a farewell address that you have here that Luke uh, gives us, that Paul said there's many times that we have seen people give very emotional uh, f farewell addresses. I think of George Washington when he got his soldiers, his uh, officers together at the end of the Revolutionary War. And he said that he resigned his commission and he thought he was going to go back to being a farmer again. But he said, uh, with heart filled with love and gratitude, I now take my leave. I most devoutly wish that your latter days may be as prosperous and as happy as your former ones have been glorious and honorable. And the men raised their glasses and there wasn't a dry eye in the audience. But uh, people loved George Washington, he was just a born leader. You think about uh, uh, when, the, when General MacArthur gave his farewell uh, address to Congress at the very end where he says, old sh soldiers never die, they just what? Fade away, you don't forget those words. And there wasn't a dry eye in Congress at that time. But here we have a man now that is given his life and they've seen him beaten as last week we saw the list of things that he went through probably some of them in Ephesus where he was uh, where he was so mistreated by the Jew as well as Gentiles and yet we see now that as he is going back and he just feels compelled to go back to Jerusalem and then of course on to Rome that uh, his missionary days as far as his first three tours are over and these churches now are going to live or die on their own. And what a blessing it is to look back at what God had done and the great miracles that God had done in the lives of so many. And that's one of the blessings of 
being a minister of God, whether it's somebody that you brought to church and all of a sudden they just blossom or a Sunday school teacher or a pastor or whatever, where you have just uh, invested a little bit of time in their lives and have pointed them in a certain direction and God has just opened up all kinds of avenues of service for that person. And what a blessing that is to see. And here we see that Paul, you can imagine, as he went from Philippi to Thessalonica, uh, down to Corinth, and uh, on over to, uh, to Asia, and now he's going down the eastern or the western side of what is present-day Turkey, but it was called Asia back then, and, uh, and just stopping at Miletus and talking to the people there and spending all night with them and that's preaching. Remember the, the fellow that even fell out of the window and he raised from the dead. But what a blessing that must have been. Then he gets down to Miletus and Miletus was just a few miles from upstream or down, it was the port city of the little river that where Ephesus came by. And so he asked the men from Ephesus, that main church, the church, uh, I would call it his magnum opus, his greatest work. Now he asked the elders to come down. And of course, these were the leaders in the church. And so he wanted them to come down and he wanted to talk to them and just to pray with them before he left, knowing that he would see them no more. We see that several times in the passage. But in this, we see Paul's a great passion for his people. And we see his personal testimony. As you begin in chapter 17, we see that, uh, or verse, uh, chapter 20, verse uh, 20, uh, verse uh, 20, uh, 28, excuse me, 18, he says, and when they had come to him, they said, you know, brothers, we work together and you know this, I'm not telling you anything new. And from the very first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I lived among you and with many tears. In other words, he wept for the people. Like remember when he was in Athens, he looked over the city and he was moved to tears because of the idolatry that was in that city and the sin. And so when he came to Ephesus, and even though he was beaten, and even though there were riots and all kinds of other things that had happened all during his ministry, he was ready one more time to give it a try and to see these people who served in the temple of Diana. And so many of them had lived such wretched lives and to see God, the power of God, change them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan and to, to God. What a blessing that is in the ministry. And now we see that many of these people have left their old idolatrous workers, works. They have now, their families have been uh, joined together, uh, reunited. They, have, they are starting to live stable lives. And now many of them have become leaders within the congregations. And uh, we don't know exactly the makeup of this uh, church at the time because notice he went, uh, he talked to them um, publicly and then he talked to them house to house. So we don't know if they were able to have uh, different leaders in different uh, houses uh, or whether uh, they had a main congregation. Uh, that's the way it is in China and a lot of other places today. If you're going to be a pastor, you don't raise a big congregation. You go from house to house or from place to place, and you hope you raise up leaders within that. And uh, we don't know exactly how they did. Did they come together? We hope so. Later on, we know the churches were able to, to come together and have fairly large-sized congregations. By the time that Timothy comes along, we see that the church had pretty well formed and that, uh, that he was speaking uh, as the pastor of the church, and he was telling them, don't let the elders intimidate you. Don't let those who are that uh, experienced Christians intimidate you. You get in there and preach the word of God. And so we see that, uh, that now Paul is see, seeing these people, and he's encouraging them along. And we see that, uh, first of all, then he says, you know how I lived among you with many tears. Now, the reason he, the, the tears is fo folks, to the unsaved person, the gospel is harsh. Notice that he said that he preached repentance toward God and, um, and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's exclusive. You mean that we're, that here we are, the hub of a great uh, a religious people that come all over the world to worship at Diana, and you're telling us that uh, with all the many gods we have, that God, Jesus Christ, is the only God? Yes. 
And not only that, but you need to repent from your sins and accept him. That is harsh to the world. Have you, tell, have you tried to tell someone that they're living in sin today? They don't like it. Now you say, well, uh, of course, I don't tell them they're in sin. I just say, this is what the word of God says. And like I said in Sunday school this morning, you just think about adultery. Anything outside of marriage is adultery. Boy, that takes care. Boy, you telling me? Boy, and people will attack you in all kinds of things today about that today because of all the perversions that's going on. And so you don't even have to say anything except that God, you know, that this is what God says. And so you can imagine, as he was saying, you've got to turn from your sin and accept the Lord Jesus as your Savior. The harshness that must have sounded to so many people who said, oh my, there's all kinds of gods and we could just worship him the way we want to. No, my friend, if you worship the true God, you will worship him the way he wants you to or you don't worship him at all. Now, in saying that, you can imagine how that you want to be firm and yet you want to be loving and notice he did it with tears. I I don't mind hellfire and brimstone preaching as long as the person who's preaching at me, and I know I need it at times, does it with tears. If they're doing it just because they want to overbear, you be overbearing or because they're righteous, no, my friend, there's none of us righteous, no, not one. But oh, that we see that we're sinners in need of repentance. There's always something in my life and in yours that I have to de- deal with. And I, as Paul says, I have to die daily. There's just, uh, that's the way life is. And yet there's a God who loves me and gave himself for me. And so we see that, these, that this was the message that Paul preached uncompromisingly to this city of many gods with all the riches of that temple and all the prestige of that, that, uh, that that city had because of that temple. And yet Paul came in there and preached to them the wondrous true love of a true God who loved them and gave, them, gave himself for them. And so he did it with tears. He didn't do it uh, with uh, meanness, but he did it as gently and kindly and yet forcefully as he possibly could. And notice he kept back nothing. I mean, he just, uh, he gave it everything he had. He didn't hedge. He didn't pull any punches. He just preached the truth and let the chips fall where they may, with tears now, of course, but at the same time realizing that there would be many people that would hate his guts because of what he said. That's where we are today, isn't it, folks? And preaching the word of God, and there's no compromise. If we start compromising and saying, well, there's many ways to heaven, if we start allowing people to come in and tell us, well, there's you know, comparative religions and all that, then folks, we've just lost the message and we might as well close up shop. No, there's only one way to heaven, and that is through Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Folks, we cannot compromise that one iota, no matter what the World Council of Churches or the National Council of Churches or any denomination or any church in this neighborhood. No, we cannot compromise and say there's many different ways to heaven as long as you're sincere. Nope. Paul said there's one way and it's repentance for your sins and accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior. Today, people don't want to be hurt. They don't want to be told about the, their sin. They want to be told about the love of God and how that the God loves them. Uh, and just, but let's don't talk, don't, uh, this idea of no judgment. Let's, uh, we hear this all the time, no judgment zones, no, and all this. In other words, I want to do whatever I want to do, but I don't want anybody, including God, to condemn me for doing it. And folks, God will judge us one day. And of course, the word of God judges us. And so what are we to do? Now, I'm not, I don't want to go around and, and tell everybody they're sinners. No, all I got to do is start talking about the a just and righteous God and they start realizing they're sinners. And so we say all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And yes, we tell them that. And many times you don't even have to, exp- and you don't need, and what I notice when God, when you start to, uh, telling people about the Lord Jesus and telling them that we're all sinners, they don't need to know and they don't need a list of sins. It's interesting how the Holy Spirit starts convicting them of sin because why? It's the Holy Spirit that convicts them of sin. And they know they're wrong. They know something is wrong in their lives. And so that's one reason 
The world is so angry with Christians. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear that they're sinners, no matter how much guilt they carry. And yet we see that with tears, we don't fight back with them. We love them. And so we want them to know the Lord Jesus as we know him. And so we see that Paul, with great tears, loved these people. And he kept back nothing. And he didn't pull any punches. He just preached the word of God the best he knew how. And he asked God to use that. Now in saying that, we see that also, that his focus now, he realized that he had to move on and that God had other things for him. It's kind of interesting. It almost sounds negative where Paul is saying, and now see in verse 22, now I'm, I'm bound by the Spirit to go to, to, to go to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall happen to me, except that uh, the Lord had already told me back when, remember Agabus, the, uh, the prophet said that uh, back when he was first saved, that uh, I want you to tell him the great sorrow or the great persecution he's going to go through for my name's sake. Now, how would you like to be saved and somebody come along and say, now the Lord has told me to tell you that you're going to go through some real sorrows, but you're going to have a great ministry. I would like to say, Lord, I want the great ministry, but I don't want the sorrows. Amen. But they who walk godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Folks, there's just going to be some sorrow out there in walking with the Lord. Now, the Lord pointedly told, Saul, told Paul about that. And so we see that in every city, notice chains and tribulations uh, await me. <laughs> yeah, that almost sounds like, uh, what is it called? Uh, it's, that uh, he, he realizes it's going to happen to him. That uh, when I go, I just, I'm, going to, I'm going to be persecuted. That's just the way it is. And so we see, he says, but none of these things move me. In fact, I've just got to the point where I'm used to it. But I, count my life, I don't count my life dear to myself. In fact, he told the Corinthians earlier as he had preached to them or written to them, he says, I'd lot rather die. The only reason I'm here is because God left me here to witness to you. But he said, absent from the body, what? Present with the Lord. I'm ready to go see the Lord. But he's got a mission for me. And so he said, I know that God, uh, I want, but he says, I want to finish my race with joy. Remember what he told, uh, told uh, Timothy in 2 Timothy? He said that I, I finished my course, I've run the race, and now it's laid up for me, the rewards that God has for me in heaven. But that was his goal in life, that he would finish strong. That's one thing I've asked the Lord in my ministry, is Lord, uh, let me finish strong. Let me, let me finish uh, with joy. And uh, yes, there's sorrows, there's heartaches, there are desertions, there are hurts, there are the Demases, there are the, uh, the other people that hurt you along the way. But as I said in Sunday school this morning, uh, those are all things that God just says happen. And if you let them, you'll start hating people. After a while, you'll just want to withdraw. But if you're a child of God as a, as a minister of God, and all of us are ministers, then, oh, that we can learn to weep for that person who's mistreated us that we could pray for that person. Remember what the Lord tells us in the Sermon on the Mount? He says, pray for them who despitefully use you and say all manner of evil against you for my name's sake. So Lord, if they're going to say mean things about me, may it be because of what you have done and not because of what I have done. Amen. I don't want to be a scandal. I want to be a blessing. And yes, if people mock me, if people say things about me because of you, that's one thing. If they say it because of me, I don't, that's not going to bring joy. And so he says, I want people, if they're going to bless me or curse me, I want it to be because of, Lord, what you have done in my life. I want to finish my, my race with joy. I <clears throat> just uh, think of my home pastor who um, I took my second born, Jason, when he, he and I went by to see him back several years ago now. He was up in his 90s. He's got a walker now. He's a year older than Al. But, um, but I've seen that pastor go through. I mean, I've heard some mean things about that guy, a small town. I mean, I've seen people that uh, one time when I was my young 
I was a very confused teenager. I'd go to church and they were talking about giving him a raise and how much they loved him one week. And the next week, or the next, seemed like a few weeks later, uh, I walked in the middle, I was with a bunch of teenagers out back and they, there was a room full of them. And I just felt the tenseness in there. I think I was going to get some water or Coke or something. And uh, I was passing through and I heard somebody say something about the pastor. And, uh, and I would say, I thought you people loved him. And I never will forget this lady just laughed like the witch of Endor, you know, and just, ah, oh, you don't know. And I'm going, you know, looking back on now, I was 14 or 15 years old. Uh, that woman was a pretty cruel woman. And yet, you know, you look at and the, and that pastor, and I think about him and how that he just loved everybody that we talked about. And how that Jason came away from there saying, you know, there's something about him. You know why? Because he just loved people and he wasn't going to hold the grudges against them. And yet, uh, and what a blessing he is. I think that's one reason the Lord allowed him to live. He's still got a great influence. People will come from all over to, to see the man because of his love for the people. And I'll see something on the internet every once in a while, somebody in that small town, and now they'll talk about going by to see Riddle Limp. And what a blessing that is, because he just loved people in spite of the fact that people, and many of them, could say some pretty mean things about him. Oh, I want to be like that. I want to be like the Apostle Paul, don't you? Where, uh, and one thing I've got to work on, and you do too, is bitterness. I got to work on feeling sorry for myself. I got to work on all those things, don't you? We all do. And yet Paul says, the one driving force in my life. I know I'm going to get more of it. I've had it in the past. But the one thing I'm going to keep on loving people no matter how they love me. Isn't that a great way to do it? And so he had the love of Christ in his heart for the people. And so he had a great focus on the love of God and the love that had God, God had for others. And he knew that, his, that even though he was going back to a hotbed of rebellion in, in uh, Jerusalem, that he was going there because he loved the people and he wanted to see them saved. Later on in the book of Romans, he writes, <clears throat> and he says, oh, I would, give, I would even go to hell if my brethren, the country, my countrymen, would be saved. Oh, that's dedication, isn't it? He says, I would I want to see my brothers, my countrymen, my fellow Jews saved before the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see, first of all, then, his great testimony and his drive to serve the Lord. But then also, we see the warnings now. He gets down to business. He's talked about himself. Now he wants to start, to start talking to, to the elders about his concern for them. In verse 25, and indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching to the, the kingdom of God, there it is, I'm preaching the kingdom, he says of God, uh, will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. I mean, I've, I've laid it out. I haven't held anything back, and I don't feel guilty for holding back anything that God gave me to give to you. For I have not shunned to declare you, to you the whole counsel of God. Now, that's a key passage, a whole counsel of God. That's what Paul told Timothy, preach the word, the whole counsel. But it's so easy today to get off on certain topics. Oh, people want to hear about the rapture. They want to hear about, uh, about <clears throat> the second coming and all the different things that God's going to do on earth. And of course, Armageddon. Well, that's part of the counsel of God. Be ready. But he also says, if we have this hope in us, then we're to purify ourselves even as we are pure. In other words, that's a, a 1 John 2, 3. And so if this is true in our lives, then what should we be doing? We should be purifying ourselves and wanting God. Wait a minute, I don't want to hear that, Pastor. I just want to hear about the three, uh, three bones in the mouth of the bear and Daniel. Well, that doesn't matter. And who cares if you know everything about the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation and it doesn't change your life? I have seen people. In fact, I had one man that wanted to preach in my church. And, uh, and boy, he had some good material. And I saw him in a seminar, and boy, it was just fantastic stuff. And I said, man, I'd, but then I started realizing his personal life was in shambles. And as a result, I mean, and he, and he wasn't coming out of it either. 
And I'm saying, how can I have a man like that come into my church and preach to my people about the things that are coming? Whenever all he's got to do is condemn them, say they can live the way they want to as long as they, you know, just think about Jesus. No, my friend, the whole counsel of God convicts of sin. And it drives, it leads us away from sin and to righteousness. If you'll notice Paul later on, or when he writes to the, uh, to, to the Ephesians from Rome, he goes, he, t- he establishes the church and talks about the accepted and beloved in chapters one through three. But in chapters four through six, all he does is to give a primer of how holy and righteous living, how to live for God, how to, how to live personally for the Lord, how to, as a man, how to be a leader of your family. And right on down, how to be honest in your dealings with people, how to be filled with the Spirit, and how to be singing to the Lord, and how to love people, and to love your wife even as yourself. All these different things that we see that just was a primer of, of righteous living that Paul gives them. That's the whole counsel of God, folks. So yes, I like prophecy. I'd love to get into it. I love, uh, we can talk about uh, uh, other things. You talk about Bible archaeology. You can talk about uh, uh, food. Uh, people get off hung on that. Uh, I had a family that left the church one time because they got off on uh, on food and how that uh, you know we weren't holistic or whatever and all these different things. People get uh, we've had problems here with people saying well get off on Christmas or whatever you know or or then we got uh, had another person got off on uh, on Easter all, all these different uh, boy you can get going but folks let's just preach the whole counsel of God and I'll get off on any one tangent. And so this is what Paul is saying. He says uh, that as he preaches the whole counsel of of God, he says, therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock. Make sure that you are balanced. He says, among the whole of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Notice this Holy Spirit that raises up people within the church. Notice the shepherd. Now, shepherd guards as well as leads. And so you're responsible for the wolves that are coming because he says, you know, I'm no fool. Um, I've been around long enough to know that after my departure, in verse 29, savage wolves, the New King James says, savage wolves will become among you. There will be people that come to church and they will... Uh, tell you they're saved and will make a profession without having a possession. And they're going to get into the church and they're going to infiltrate and uh, their decisions and the things they're doing is not, not, they, they are not sanctified people. And yet they could be very popular. They could be businessmen. They could be uh, educators. They could be all kinds of different people, but they don't really know the love of God in their lives. And they're, they're, going, to rip, they're going to try to rip the church apart. And folks, that's one reason as a pastor and as uh, leaders in the church, we've got to be spiritually discerning. And that's one thing that Paul was telling him. You've got to learn how to discern truth from error and the sheep from the wolves. And so be careful with this. You just don't accept anybody and everybody in the church. Uh, and, uh, And once you do, as a church member, one thing that I've learned in the ministry now is if somebody comes forward and wants to join the church, uh, then I, uh, one of the things I want to do before we say, okay, everybody just uh, let's accept them. Are we glad to have them? No, I want to take them along and say, what do you believe? When were you saved? What's in your life? And I've had people that uh, after they realize where we stand said, no, I don't want it. That's fine. It's better for us to know then than it is afterwards. So like uh, if, uh, if, you know, a guy asks a girl to marry him. Mean, you're not ready for her to say no before marriage and after marriage. <laughs> Amen? And so it is in life. And so it's very important that we filter out. And we just don't accept everybody and anybody. And at the same time, we love everybody. And we want to see them saved. But there's going to be people that are going to come in. And some of them are intentionally going to try to destroy the church. One of the things you got to be careful with out west, especially in places like Utah or Wyoming and places like that where the Mormon influence is very strong, is that uh, you will think that you've won several Mormons to the Lord and all of a sudden they've got more people within uh, the church, ex-Mormons, than you had you know, people that when you got there. And it's not long before they're voting you out, of, voting, the, uh, the voting to take the church into 
of the Mormon congregation. It's just amazing. She had to be careful with things like that. And so, yes, we've got to be careful that we realize that there are, there are people out there that want to just destroy us. And Satan is an angel of light, is he not? But then there are going to be people that are going to rise up in your church and they're going to want their little Bible studies. And they're going to want their own little clique. And he says, you've got to be careful with them too because they're going to be the ones who, who go off on these tangents. And they're going to think that they know more than the pastor because he doesn't always hit this uh, thing every service. And so as a result of that, and, you know, and that's the one way that cults get started is because if you'll notice, most cults will take one or two verses out of context and have a whole doctrine around it. And so here we see that this, Paul says, be careful. This is what's going to happen even back in the first century. Folks, so in the church, uh, as much as we love and care for one another, it is a, we want it to be a place where people can come and feel loved with one another, but we've just like our marriages or anything else, we've got to be on guard. We got to lead and we got to be able to say yes or no to protect ourselves. And so we see that this is what Paul is telling here. You've got to be careful about your congregation and bringing people in. And of course, that means sometimes you've got to exclude some people. And I've said many times, if you don't believe the Bible is the word of God and that we, that we take our final authority from him, and if you think there's all kinds of errors in this Bible, then you don't need to, be, need to be a member of this church. Now, I try to be kind about that, but isn't that what we believe? You don't need to. Uh, if you want to uh, live in sin and you want to go off and get into, and it's so sad to see churches that are voting on this perversion that is going on today when it's, when it's obvious sin, and that tells us that some evil and corruption has gotten into the church, hasn't it? And churches are being ripped apart by all this, all the things from, uh, from the perversions and so forth that are going on today. How sad. It should have never happened. And so be very careful about what, who you let in and what you do once they get there. And so he says now, with that, he says, therefore, watch and remember. It's kind of interesting. Now, he says uh, to love them. And remember later on, uh, 35 years later, the apostle John is writing to this same church. A generation later, he says, I'm, you know, you're to be commended because you have learned how to separate truth from error in Revelation chapter 2. And you've learned how to, to, to condemn that which is unholy. But he said, I have somewhat against thee because you've lost your first love. So you got to keep that love up. Now, he wasn't condemning them over. He said, but you got to work on your love. And so as a church, we've always got to work on something. Either we've got to work on, uh, we've got to work on sin or we've got to work on love. We've got to work or all of it together. There's always something to work on, folks. We'll never be perfect in this life. So I don't want to go to church because it's just full of problems. Well, that's the, way, that's the way your family is too, isn't it? It's the way it is your life is. So as a church, we've got to learn how to love one another and disagree with one another and yet care for one another. And so this is what Paul is telling them. This is, if you're going to be a leader in a church, uh, then you need to be an influence. Uh, they call them influencers today. You want to make sure that you're a positive influence and that you are a guard against sin. And so we see that Paul warns them and, he's, and uh, we see that uh, the Holy Spirit has made them, and of course, this is one thing we want to be very, um, we want to be uh, pliable to the Holy Spirit and what He wants in our lives, because there are people within and without who will try to destroy the church. Satan is working overtime, isn't he, in our country, and in our churches, in our families. Oh, that the Lord would teach us that He's an angel of light and not a guy with uh, horns. Although today, he's coming out with horns. And so, uh, so we see that then Paul's final exhortation, and I love this. He's talking with him, and he gives him very strong warnings. He says, so brother, and I commend you to God and to the word of God, verse 32, and to the word of his grace, which is able to get, build you up. 
I can't stay with you forever. There's so, sometimes I have to cut you off. There are certain things I can't teach you. You've got to learn on your own. There are certain, just so much that I could teach you spiritually. But, and I can't stay here in your life forever. But oh, that God, who has, I've tried to impart to you, will take you and now lead you to greater things than I've ever done. And he says, I have coveted no man's money. And he says, you know how I wasn't in it for the money. But I have shown you in verse 35, I've shown you every way by laboring. I care for you. And you, uh, you've you seen my work. I haven't sat back in my office or sat back, uh, but uh, you've seen me out uh, working for the things of God. You've seen me toil and sweat. Nothing. We've got preachers today that believe that it's a, uh, uh, too dignified to sit for the people to see them sweat. Well, maybe we need to get out and do a little bit better, more mixing and mingling with the people. But we see that uh, that Paul was just a, just a man, and yet he cared for the people. But then he says something. He says, remember these words the Lord Jesus said. Now, of course, he says, you've got... Back before, he said, one thing you got to learn is how to support the weak. There's always people that are going to be weaker than you. Are you an exhorter or a discourager? There's somebody in this church, no matter uh, if you've been here for any length of time, there's going to be people that are going to be a little weaker than you are or weaker in a certain area than you are. Do we kind of try to raise them up or do we just go around condemning them and form our own little clique of people that are a little bit better than the, the lower crowd and so we just associate with those who are on the spiritual level that we are. Now, of course, I think in our congregation, we're, we're looking forward to whatever we can do to help people. But at the same time, he said, that's the one thing you always got to keep in mind. There's always somebody that needs encouragement. There's always somebody that needs exhortation. There's also always somebody who comes in who just needs a loving hand to care for them. And you may be the voice of God in their lives at that moment. And that's what the accepted and the beloved is all about. That's what the body of Christ is all about. But then he makes a statement that has caused a lot of confusion. Because he says, and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. You won't find that in the Gospels. You won't find any place in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John where Jesus made that direct quote. But it does tell us something about the character of Jesus. And it tells us that this was one of his main themes in his life. Was he, what did he say? I laid down my life for my sheep. And you could just rest assured that this is one of the things that the people came away from whenever they saw their Lord was, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And so we see that, of course, this is something, in my Bible, it's a red letter edition, so it's red letters because that's what Jesus said. So obviously he said it. But do we believe it? Is it more blessed to give than to receive in a day where it's more blessed to get than it is to give? You know, uh, people, <coughs> we, we love that. Many of us memorized the... Um, preamble to the Constitution where it talks about our prosperity and um, both for ourselves and for our posterity. And someone has said, you know, we're, we care so much about our pros prosperity today that we care nothing about the posterity, posterity, in other words, our children. And how many children are being sacrificed today because of the lusts of the flesh and of sin? And our, that's why I'm thinking, Lord, if you don't come soon, our nation is doomed. We don't have we don't have the we don't have the spiritual or the cultural fiber in our nation for another generation to come along. Because what's a mother and father? What's marriage? It's all being destroyed. These kids today don't have families. They're it's, it's so sad to see. And so it is very important that we give of ourselves. And show people the love of God. Yes, holding nothing back. And yes, realizing that there are going to be times when you, hey, listen, everybody else is doing it. Why don't you do it? Or why are you, are you telling me that this is wrong? No, I'm just saying that this is what God says. 
And so notice it's more blessed to give. And the one of the greatest gifts that you can give anybody, my friend, is the truth. I am the way, the truth. And so we do it lovingly and with tears, and yet we do it passionately and caringly for the people that we're talking to. And so this great love that he had for the people is more blessed to give than to receive. But then we see he bowed down and he prayed with the people. And they wept freely. I like that. Grown men crying. Grown men crying for the love that they had for this man. And they fell on his neck and kissed him. And they sorrowed most for the words that he said, well, we won't see you anymore. Yes, parting is such sweet sorrow. But one day, they knew they'd see him in heaven. And what a blessing it is to know that some of the great people that we have loved in the past, the hope of the believer, is that one day we'll see him again. We've had people depart from this congregation over the past few years, kind of at an almost at an accelerated rate. And yet, isn't it great, folks, to know that one day we'll see him again. One day we'll stand before the Lord in him complete. And those old problems that they had, those eyeglasses won't be there anymore. The hearing aids won't be there anymore. The, the lips won't be there anymore. It'll all be perfect in the place with God. Yes, they wept. But the hope that they had was they'd see him again. And folks, that's the hope that we have today, isn't it? That we'll all together be with the Lord by and by. Oh, that the Lord would allow us to truly love people holding nothing back. Wise, but loving. That we would realize that there's a lot of people out there that are wolves, not because of their choice, but because of who controls them, the father and the devil. But do we, have, do, we, do we care about them? Do we want to see them saved? Do we care about that person out there on the street yelling and screaming at God and, and at the church and blaming us for everything? That person is blind. And they want, and oh, that we, they would see, that they would be saved and know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Let's hold back nothing. Let's preach the whole counsel of God. Yes, God is love, but God is judge. God cares about, uh, about our souls, but he cares about our sin. And oh, that we would want to be washed by the blood of the Lamb and to see others washed and saved and growing in his grace. Let's pray. Father, we come before you tonight, today as sinners, saved by your grace. Left in this world, Lord, you tell us our times are in your hands. And so we know, Lord, that you have a place of purpose for us. You have a will in our lives. And you have a desire that, to use us, Lord, that others will come to know you as their Savior. Oh, Father, may we do it lovingly, compassionately, sacrificially, but wisely. Oh, Lord, use us as a church as you use the Apostle Paul. May others come to know you, and may we all be able to sing together, Lord, those great songs of the faith that one day we'll see you by and by. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.